so now uh, before I, I I do this this one, um, ha have either of you seen this activity before? No. All right. So since I know the answer, I don't think that it's, it's fair for me to uh, be the the one to uh, to to participate. So. I, I'm going to give the the two of you about uh, maybe like five minutes or so. You can draw on the screen, uh, talk about it, uh, whatever, for five or so minutes. And then I'll uh, give you some insight into the problem at, at that point. So what do you think, Enda? You think we add even number all the time? Do you think the same thing? I mean, it seems like if they're adding in one dot per row, but also adding in, or they're adding in one row and also one dot per each column, then I'm, I'm getting that the pattern is going to be, there's going to be 20, there's going to be there's going to be 20 rows by the 20 by the 20th step they'll have 20 rows but they'll have 21 dots in each row yeah okay so that would be ugh, uh math 420 is that 420 20 times 21 oh it will be 21 times 21 isn't it yeah so I'm thinking, I'm thinking there's gonna be 420 dots total in the 20th step. Okay. I'm still doing it. Okay. Yeah, I agree with you. Okay. All right. So 
Let, let me uh, ask a, a different question then. Uh, can you give a, a a formula or a formula for any um, any step? Yeah, any step. Yeah. Like, Do you I mean guess... how many dots added or? Uh, the the formula for the number of dots at, at any step. So, like the if I said um, n plus one times n. Okay. All right. Yes. So now let me ask you this. Uh, um. How do, how do I say this? It, do you think that 420 is a unique answer? Or can you think of a different way to look at the problem? So I'm going to give you a like a couple of minutes to think about the problem again and see if if you can come up with a different answer other than 420, whether it's using a different formula to, or uh, that you can uh, come up with given the, the pattern of only the first three steps or some other reasoning that you come up with. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to think about that one now. We can use a recursive formula. Yeah. But the end result will be the same, but the way we got there using recursive formula. Is that what you have in mind? Yeah, I, I agree. And it's just it's only I mean the, the formula we have is only off by division by two if you're adding up the first in consecutive in, or yeah, adding up in consecutive positive integers. It's only because it's off by two because we start off with two cool. dots to begin with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so what, what would your recur here? I can write down what would your recursive formula look like then? Um, so the first number would be two, mm -hmm. and then the second. Wait, let, let me write that down what I have in mind. You're thinking about recursive formulas in what a like a sub n is equal to what previous step or steps? Yeah. Okay. Well, I, here I, I'm going to give you a, well, while you're thinking about that, or or maybe not. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, if I I'm going to tell you that. You got the answer, the textbook answer correct, but you, the, the the if you let n be the the step number, and so like one, two, three, and then these are the the dots. Well, let's say that you actually look at this and you you do something like um, oh yeah like let's say you you see well those went that increased by four right let's say you saw that one increased by like a, another six but what if you assume that the 
like because it didn't say that the next one only goes up by seven because it didn't say right so it only you only had to assume that all it said is that at each step more dots are are added in that the number added at each step is more than the number added in the previous step but it didn't actually say that it it had to the be anything indefinitely. And it said the pattern continues infinitely so the pattern should be like if you have that kind of row and columns then the pattern should still stay the same right that's what i get from the the problem well, there. but the, but the question though was uh just more than the previous the question was about the number of dots though so that that's like the question was about the number of dots and not about uh, describing the pattern that's the only mm -hmm. catch here so like uh, so if somebody if somebody saw a different pattern then you know like it, if somebody saw a different pattern then who's to say that they, they might be be wrong yeah so, so i mean if I, the pattern i saw in the dots was that hey like uh well it, it just i have to the pattern is like if you look at the pattern and the the numbers that the all the pattern instead of looking at the pictures the pattern and the actual numbers that the pattern is that they're increasing uh, by at least one more than the previous one then i then that that's different than maybe looking at the the pattern in the in the pictures them of the formation of what the pictures would look like themselves so that's just a thought and not like a, a like a, a end all thought but it's one of them and so if you do that then then the that that would give you the uh, lowest number possible of dots that you could get which ends up being uh 220 all right, sorry, uh, 267 dots. Now, I'm not going to tell you everything about this. I'll, I don't want to actually have it be too big of a surprise, but let's say that you do something like the... Um, like you look, look at the the ratios of the the dots so let's say that this was multiplied by three and then by uh by uh what is it by yeah let, let's say you do two and then you multiply the next one by three let's say the the pattern end up being like like a multiply by three, multiply by two, multiply by three, multiply by two, right? Because there's nothing that says that that couldn't be the pattern also, then this one would actually be adding 36. And then by the time you get to the 20th step, you would have 6,466,176 dots. So that's another way to, to look at it as as well so all right I, I'll, I'll tell you though that this is one of those where um where the the problem the original problem was given on a a national standardized test and the answer was expected to be 420 but because of the fact that there were, were, you know, it wasn't clear exactly what was going on, that only 6% of students got the, the problem correct. But at the same time, I, I think that that shows the, in a, in a way, the importance of inquiry-based learning because 
that can't be measured on a standardized test where you put down one correct answer. And then if a student was thinking about the problem a different way that you weren't maybe thinking about when you wrote the, the question, then, then you're probably going to you know, uh, mark the student wrong. Although if a lot of students actually got a problem incorrect, you might actually go back and say a lot of students got incorrect and then you start investigating the student reasoning. But maybe the, the lesson here is that you should investigate the, the reasoning before it gets to the point that, that this would, would happen. So that's just a thought. All right. Now let me, uh oh, I hope you at least enjoyed that. And actually, I'll show you. I'll, I can share this paper with you at, at the end, but it, it actually shows at least there, there are several ways that, uh, uh, that this paper shows to do the problem. So uh, one of the answers end up being 1,048,614 even. <laughs> so th that's my whole point is sometimes like even on my uh, problems that I give my classes, one thing I'll, I'll do is say, can you do the problem a different way? Or can you show me a different solution? Or uh, can you get a, a different answer? Or how would that look? So a lot of my problems definitely don't have one correct answer. And even, uh, if, if, even if it does have like a single, say, number that's correct, I, I know that there's lots and lots and lots of ways to get to the same answer. And so any of those are okay. And, and I think that having the students like think about the different ways is, is helpful. So now you can just say this out loud, but it, since there's, there's just two, two of you, but I, I want you to think of a, a class or just a topic within a class that you think IBL would be the most helpful for and why. So that could be, something like a, a topic where you know that's difficult for students and you want them to get a, a deeper a mathematical understanding of it or a topic where you just don't feel like you've ever been able to to get it just right with the students and you're willing to try a new technique on it uh, whatever it might be uh, what are your your thoughts uh, Enda do you want to go first uh, this reminded me of whenever we have to deal with rational expressions, students tend to forget that they have to make sure to eliminate or to exclude whatever values that will make the denominator zero. And I remember giving them a problem with the answer. And I said, what do you think about the answer? Is this correct or incorrect? And it should be incorrect because that number should be the, what I call by forbidden numbers, because you cannot include that number as part of the solution because it will make the denominator zero. But the students cannot really see them because when you simplify the expression, that value disappears. So they don't think about that anymore. And I think students have to be reminded all the time about those. So. That's the thing that I remember. And then also when we deal with a square root expression, we have to make sure to check whether our answer are not what makes the square root a negative values. And logarithm as well. Yeah, those kind of type of things that students always miss. So I always give them an answer of a, sol uh, of a problem and ask them whether the answers are correct or not and why they think that should be correct or incorrect. All right, thank you, Inda. Uh, Mike, how about you? That last example made me think immediately of the difference, having students um, figure out the difference between linear, exponential, and quadratic modeling problems, where they're just given a set of data 
and they're asked which model would be most appropriate and having them think through the relationships between consecutive terms is immediately what I thought of with that last problem. Uh, so the, 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 yeah, the difference between consecutive terms. Yeah. Cause most students think very with, with linear functions primarily and may, maybe to a lesser extent quadratic functions, but getting students to understand the difference between linear quadratic and then also exponential is a, a challenge sometimes. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. I remember I gave the students a problem, uh, not a problem. I gave them one quadratic equations, and then I asked them to say five things about the properties of that equation. And I said, uh, there is no slope. And I was like, why are you talking about the slope? We are talking about something that is not linear. Yeah, so, yeah, that's a good point. Well, like most students, whenever they're, I mean, most of, I'm teaching college algebra more often than any other course. And the techniques that students use are mo primarily for linear equations. Mm -hmm. And it's just vastly different if they understand the difference between the types of equations, types of functions, types of relationships between just uh, sequences of numbers would even help. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think that the, the, I feel like the overarching issue is just types of functions and domain and range. So then I, I, I think that we can, um, why don't we, we start with that issue then and so let me like say this all right let's let me clear this and so uh oh i don't know what has happened because i want it to clear <clears throat> so a lot of these things are uh, that, that both of you mentioned are, are things that are very good strategies for converting a standard question to an inquiry based question, like rephrasing a solving a problem as a question, or, or like you mentioned in the state five properties about the function instead of just like graph this function, or what is the domain and range? Like just tell the student to state five properties and make them think about what the function is and and, and uh, what it would look like. And then Mike, you talked about the, the pattern recognition and that's an important thing also. And maybe uh, asking for counter examples or you know, uh, what would happen if, uh, uh, we're, we're, I had one that would be a good like counter example, but like maybe, show why the probability of, of uh, an event can't be greater than one or, you know, like uh, things like that could be good, good practice. Now, one thing I will say, I put these two documents here because last year, the, uh, the AMATIC, had a Midwest meetup where we talked about the the group work and assessment online and, and people came up with some of these uh, suggestions for ideas for for problems and so a, a lot of these are are things that that you may have thought of like asking asking students like why did you find a certain problem difficult or using the the open ended properties and and uh, maybe you were being too nice because somebody's suggestion was to list 10 properties of a function <laughs> so maybe you you up it from 5 to 10 who knows <laughs> but uh but yeah uh, so. so with that five students one student managed to make one property into five so what was that mm, the leading coefficient is 3 
uh, the leading term is 3x squared. That so it's just saying the same thing. Nothing about the intercepts. Nothing about so just one. Oh that. boy! So if I make it ten, then they would say the same thing ten times, just <laughs> using different numbers, uh, different words. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I I think that that's actually. In, in a way that's, I guess, not too bad, because at least then, you know, they know some of the vocabulary and then, and then that's a, a start. Uh, yeah. But, uh, but yes, it, it, I know that I, I mentioned already solving using a different technique. And then I'll say that the other Midwest uh, group from last year, we talked about writing some of these these questions, and this was more of a set that was done by by a topic rather than by uh, just general you know general technique. So uh, one of them here was to just come up with an example of a, a function in in real life. But I I want to say before we we uh, talk about like specifically or or go out to investigate hands on for a, a, a little while like some uh, like maybe solutions to the rational. Uh, um, like functions and the square root functions and the domain and making sure that students check their solutions to square root equations and rational equations, then there are some sources of IBL materials. And so the first one, and I'll, I'll make sure that I uh, show you where everything is at and, and what's available because th this is you know this is where I think the the best part of the presentation is probably at but there's under the Academy of Inquiry based learning website there's resources and so there's different textbooks where where you might find questions in or materials or or links, and so uh, I I do want you to take a look at, at those. But then the AIBL Dropbox folder, this one is from the uh, workshop that I attended, but I. I I know that they uh, did share. Actually, this might actually not be from that workshop. But this one is from the A uh, Michigan AIBL. Yeah, and so here there will be. Let's see. Where would yeah pre calculus would probably have our our uh, material that we're we're looking for in somewhere in here and then the IBL resource spreadsheet this I did get from the the workshop I uh, attended but I I think that that I I found uh helpful but it had a lot of the same links as on the AIBL website and then uh, what I also found though is that having everything organized by by topic was helpful and so that that is one thing that i i would recommend that when you go looking for these resources if you actually find one that you think would be uh helpful then then maybe just uh like but not for the topic that you're working on right now then just put it off to the side but uh, you can see that here's pre-calculus resources and then and then here's just some general uh inquiry techniques so i i am to to make it a, a little bit sort of 
more helpful and it may be not so o- overwhelming at, at first maybe i i thought that we could just uh, per- perhaps uh, start by just um cr- how about creating a, a document of our own for for this session and if you see something specifically uh, relating to the the topics that that we want to maybe tackle uh, today then then we can put it in there uh, collectively so this is the this is the workshop part of the workshop where it's the hands on uh, how are we going to deal with uh, rational equations and in uh, uh, square root equations Do, is, are both of you okay with th- those being our topic of focus okay so so uh, this is going to be our ideas ideas for IBL methods for uh, rational oh, rational equations and square root equations and so w- if you uh, I'll share this right now actually I'll put it in the the link in the chat and then we we're doing this all as we we go I'm doing this as we go because I didn't know what the topic would be that that we would want to talk about so let me put it in the chat and then let me say, how about in, uh, I, I can stop, how about I stop sharing my screen, but then for the uh, next, say, 20 minutes until about 3.40, we can like add to that document or and take a look and at, at whatever we find and uh, on those links. Oh, do you need all of those links shared again? <laughs> Here, you know what? I'll, I'll put all the links th- that were in the that presentation all in the in there, and then that way uh, you can. Can you see them in there? Uh, uh, hopefully. Uh, and I can still I can see them on the on the presentation you shared. Oh, uh, but not in the Google Doc. Um, I can see them. Okay. All right. Good. So then, thank you. Uh, so then, uh, does that seem reasonable? Like twenty minutes to poke around and look, and then we'll like uh, record what we find in there, and then we can share out of why we uh, put what we did in there and why we think it it could be a helpful resource for teaching either rational equations or square root equations. Okay. All right, so I'm going to, actually I'll pause the, the recording and, and mute myself so that everyone can, can concentrate and then feel free to get up and, and stretch and, and then in, at around three forty or so, twenty minutes, we'll we'll um, compare notes, recording. But I figure I might as well share my screen again so that it it will be in the in the recording. So, all right, let's go ahead and if if we want to maybe go through and. And uh, and we can all maybe explain why we've uh, chose something maybe that that might 
uh, help in terms of like adding a little extra extra value. So we can just start from the, the top. So I know that I added all the stuff in here at the beginning of uh, things that were in the presentation slides, but uh, let's see. So whoever like added, which one feel free to speak uh, to, to your, your item that you added, but uh, have students visualize via graphing a rational function. Uh, who, who added that one? That was me. Oh, I almost didn't write anything because I was distracted by whatever you wrote, so I kept looking at this thing. Oh, no. <laughs> no, I'm okay, but yeah, most of them are similar, so I'm good. So, uh, so go yeah. ahead, Mike. So that one, I just wanted to have students just know the difference of what the graphs might look like for a square root function or a rational function. Because they, I mean, according to, I mean, for my classes, that's the first time they've seen the graph of a rational function or, or a square root function, period. So just knowing the behavior of the graph. So asking the students to understand what values can they actually input into the function is important for the domain. So I thought, have students um, look at the graph and then what else did I put in? Yeah, students create their own table of values. At They ask them, ask them to use values that are very close to the value that would make the denominator zero. That way they can, they can see the, what the behavior of the graph would be when they get really close to the, the undefined X, where X equals C and just study the graph basically. So I, <clears throat> so I focus on rational functions, I guess. So I, I did something interesting and we'll see how it works out because my my students are actually turning in the uh, assignment like th this upcoming weekend but i have i'm having my students actually um uh, create a, a because, because we're talking about piecewise functions and i find out that that's one of the areas where the students really struggle with domain and so I had them create a like a Desmos artwork using just any functions that we've talked about in class. So I I really am wondering if well now I'm having the idea that if it if it ends up being a good idea that I might have them do the same thing later on in the semester, but maybe require them to only use rational functions or they have to use so many rational functions in their the uh, graph of whatever they want to draw so um so i, I like that I, idea of having the the students actually do the um the drawing and actually it's going to show the one from my class the other day but like i'm i'm refreshing the page and and it's not it is not actually uh for some reason letting me show it so all right how about the next one uh mike was that that yours so that one's mine still so this one i just i looked through the the IBL stuff from Liz West and she has some really good questions so I found this one where it's really having the students look at what what's why is the domain important for a function so she had this this problem where students are given an example where it's it's in words so it's a number of gallons that the students would need for painting and they have they have to describe the they have to give examples of input values but they also have to give the domain of the function and also describe the the range as well. well. I thought, okay, you can maybe something that would be can be extended upon that would be students can create their own function in words, not not with mathematical symbols or anything, but they come up with a function in their own words, and they have to figure out what what the domain would be for their function. 
or asked for or ask someone like a, another student what the domain would be yeah i i like that i idea and i like that that one so it so you found a lot of good things in liz west uh bookmark yeah so I, it mostly is from chapter two where she talks a lot about domain and range of a function so what else did i put down oh um you another idea would be give students just a variety of different functions just the functions not the graphs just the functions and say which functions are square root functions which ones are rational functions and then compare and contrast those functions with functions that they might be more familiar with that they they would recognize as linear functions or quadratic or polynomial but they would be able to compare and contrast why is a square root function the way it is or a rational function the way it is. Um, yeah. Oh, go ahead, Mike. I was going to talk about the next example. The next, oh, yeah. example, this is from Liz West also. It might, it, like I said, it might dive too much into calculus or pre-calculus, but having the students understand the difference between the function in number one and the function number two, even though they're the, they're they simple, I mean, the, even though the function number one simplifies, having the domain stated is extremely important. And I think that's important for students to understand. Yeah, I, I agree. In, even, though the, even though the graphing calculator will not actually show them the difference, having the students understand the difference between those two functions is vastly important. Well, and and I, I think that um like the th that's the issue that even in desmos you, you have they don't have the discontinuities in there correctly but i will say that your your handy ti83 and ti84 if you set the pixel settings correctly and zoom in enough, you can get the little discontinuity to show, but not on Desmos still, which is a, a bit unfortunate, I, I guess. But it may be, though, I, I do know that their general philosophy, though, is that the, uh, the, the student should, should, you know, have some responsibility in uh in realizing that th there's different types of discontinuities um i was going to mention that i i've been using the quicker questions in in class this semester and so i just go to the the quicker questions and then i uh, like put up a poll in, in Zoom and, and then have them enter A, B, C, or D. And then I, I sort of, of know right away which students have uh, needed more help on certain questions or, or not, but they have some for, let's see, the rational functions even. So if we're talking about domain and range of these, then, uh, let's see, yeah, so which of the following is a graph for this, or which of the following represents this graph? Now, you know, it does say no calculators uh, allowed. So like some of these with that, that regard, I, I have not used all of them, but this is still a, a good source of, of questions. Even if like some of them I, uh, a couple of them I thought were so good that I, I gave them as homework, but I said, explain why the, the wrong answers couldn't have been the correct ones. And that was a different way of looking at the multiple choice questions, it's not necessarily asking them which one was the right answer, but explaining why the wrong ones were incorrect. So it's another way of uh, looking at these uh, quicker questions. And then... I'll honestly say that if you, as a side note, it's off of the specific topic that we were were um, uh, talking about, but the, the differential equation problems are actually really, really good. And my, my differential equation class seemed to love them. Like I did a whole class yesterday that was, we did quicker questions the entire class. 
because they they, they it, it was a lesson where uh, it was questions about uh, modeling linear differential equations and and so I wanted them to have examples of like how to set up the the differential equation so it was here's this word problem which of these would be uh, model the situation and so you can't really you can't really uh like look that up anywhere you have to know what the problem is asking so i, I like those types of problems and then uh th this one i added it was is maria anderson's uh, contemporary algebra collection but i've, I've used a, a few of these in my my classes from from the collection already but they're they're uh, fairly interesting and, and i especially when i'm talking about the the um the piecewise functions this semester it was was helpful and, and it also was helpful to give these real life examples in this case because i i realized that it, it helped the students see like oh well they're we're talking about the price of Spotify or the price of, of this uh, fog bugs program. And so the, the price can't go below zero. So they, they realize that drawing the graph below, like a, like beyond certain X values didn't quite make sense. And then uh, Maria Anderson has a, a course on Elmi education of that is an expanded version of the of the uh, contemporary algebra collection where there's there's some uh, uh, more example real world examples like that contemporary examples for every every topic in algebra so let's see how about this next one who who added that one? And the, was that that you about the incorrect steps to a, a problem? Yeah, yeah. So I ask students to solve one problem that they so they need to look problems and then they try to solve it, but they have to make sure that their solutions are incorrect. So they have to have like wrong steps or something, and then they have to give it to the other group or the other students to check what kind of mistake that they made. Yeah. And I was hoping that by that kind of activity, the students can check their own work before they submit their work so they can find if they make mistake because sometimes they cannot see like how to check their own work. So by checking somebody else, then probably they can look at theirs as well. Yeah, I, I like that idea. Uh, I, I was going to say this one here. I don't know if you've, uh, uh, have either of you heard of this one, Mike, or into the, this, uh, have you seen this file of dictionary of mathematical terms? So I, I'll say that I, I absolutely love it because it was a, a, a dictionary designed specifically for, for two-year college students. And so when you go down here, like it, it will give, a, it, it it's definitely not the, the language that's used in the Oxford Dictionary of Mathematics, like this little like blue one I've had forever, but it it's written in in understandable uh, uh, terms that I, I think that that students at the two year college can understand. And so I will have students go into the the dictionary here and and look up words and explain the definitions to each other as as a, a way of increasing their their understanding so if you are looking for you know uh, I, I wonder actually what it says about square root 
it's uh, a bit what it says about square roots even because this is where would it, it, it can't be that much farther right <laughs> because we're at s q s t s well well i, I guess uh well, I, 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 what 136 Oh, I scrolled too far. I knew it. There we go. So 136. I don't think that is. Where is that? The document's 136. Oh. <laughs> oh, thank you, Mike. Uh, that, that, that's uh, help, helpful. All right. So there it is. So I, I, I do think that that this is helpful for for students to to realize that when we're talking about square roots, it could be a we're we're talking about a type of radical and or people might just say root sometimes and and this is all very helpful I think for students. So I have them definitely look at at looking up the words to help them. And that all goes back to what I was saying earlier that for for students who may not have come into your classes, say, with the same high school background or other preparation, having this as a, a tool, like, helps put those students on a, on a more uh, level and equitable playing field that, you know, like, no one has to worry about not knowing the word now, because it's okay for everyone to go and look it up if they, they need to. So I try to get that through to the students. It's okay if you don't know the word or don't know something, but you can look it up and we all can, you know, look up a word that, that might not be familiar to us. And then I put down some of these OER resources for college algebra and pre-calculus because especially the, the Yoshiwara books uh, that they have, actually this one is the one that is, this is also one of their books, but it has a, uh, like it has, if you go, oh, it's link after link after link, uh, but they, they do have a activities workbook for their, their modeling functions and graphs book that, that might actually help uh, with uh, finding ideas for, IBL method. So an activities workbook right, right here with classroom activities for each section of their, their book. And then I, I put some, why does it say plus, plus, plus? I don't, I don't know why it says that, but, but then I also put some sort of links here to games and applets that I, I found for these sort of uh, topics of rational expressions, rational equations in radicals in the, in the past. So I guess that that's it. So what do you think Mike and Enda, maybe do you want to say one thing each just to wrap up a, like one thing that you felt was a, like something that's a good idea from this a list that we made today that you definitely want to go back and uh, try out or investigate further? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to try to practice the, some of the things that we have here next week on my classes. So let's see what happened there. Oh yes, yes, definitely. Uh, let me know what what worked and what didn't. Yeah. I'd love to hear that. How about you, Mike? Yeah, I just need to like um, go through the resources at the very top of the document and just explore some. Yeah, because I, I, um, I just looked at Liz West primarily, but I know there's others. Yeah, and that and that's my thought. Like that's why. I my my whole sabbatical plan was it uh, was supposed to be like converting the like the one course to to IBL methods because 
it, it's not something that can be done overnight. And you just have to like look at one little small topic at a time and go step by step and piece by piece. And, and so in any case, like I, I hope that, that uh, you found the, at least having a, a starting point for where to look to be deep, to be helpful, because I, I don't think that it's easy to find all the resources because yeah. it, there's <laughs> Oh, um, what what if the students gap are too big like half of them are quite good but the other half was really behind how do we bridge them because it happened to usually my classes are like that so yeah like some that. of them are not going to be able to keep up and no matter how slow we are working on and then we cannot move forward because so, we end up like trying to explain the things to the one that is really behind. Yeah, I, I think that like one of the things that is the always the big issue with uh, like, like that comes up when working with IBL is how do I still like uh, cover all the content when I I want to use some of the more of the in class time for the uh, inquiry and, and giving them a chance to collaborate with each other and ask questions, but I found that that the, when like one thing like I, I feel like the mastery learning has really helped like giving the students unlimited attempts to get a hundred percent, but otherwise it's a zero if they don't get to a hundred percent, because what will happen, I found that a lot of students, the reason why they, they uh, were struggling at first was because they, they, they were, they were behind, but then when I started doing this method, I, I told them, well, you know what? Like if you, like if I require them to do the, uh, get a hundred percent from the very first assignment, then either they, they catch up really, really quickly or else they decide it, they, they really are so far behind that it's not the right class for them. And they, they drop down to a lower class. And so I tried to, like tell them like it's okay if you're you're behind but you need to you know you need you need to work more outside of class because uh, you're not going to be ex get an exception from that 100 percent rule and so i want you to 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 um do the the tutoring and do this and do that and and then once they they realize that they can be successful and get that 100 percent it I, I don't feel like I have as like a, as many students who who are like are as far behind as when they start at the semester. So it's and that's why I I kind of alluded to the fact earlier. I guess that a lot of people who use IBO in their classes also use the mastery based learning because I. I I think that there's not really a, 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 a good way to do this otherwise because you you want students to have that time to think about how to do the problems. And so in order to give them that time, it, it, you have to wait until they get it, I guess. So I saw it. I saw that's what I do, I guess. It's just wait. And if it takes them like eight weeks it takes them eight weeks if it takes them two weeks it takes them two weeks but i'm still moving along like talking about the stuff in class but you know like i i i will wait for them to get that hundred percent so yeah do you have any closing thoughts mike 
No, I, I found everything wonderful. So uh, thank you for sharing with us on IBL. I, I didn't realize that I was doing a lot of IBL already. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, it was just a small part of the umbrella that I was doing though. So I can actually definitely expand on that though. Yep. Uh, we did. We didn't realize there's a name on that. <laughs> yeah, and and I think that 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 was the the. I I think that that's the key is that IBL sounds like it's a, um, like it, like this new thing or different thing, but it's really like you, you take something you're already doing and make a few tweaks and a few more tweaks the next semester and add another activity on a different topic. And eventually it's, it's all there. And like I said, I, I didn't learn all of this except for through going through that intensive, like we week long workshop. And when I say intensive, it was like started at like 8 AM and then we went till 5 PM every day for a week. And then went out to dinner and then had homework to do for the next day's <laughs> session. So it, it was really one of these things where I, I, I appreciate everything that I, I learned from AIBL and I uh, would say always start there because they're the, the group that, that uh, knows the, the most and has all the, the links that you would need and and will will help if you um, if you need it but you know if you really can't find something you can ask me too because I I'm sure that I have a, a link tucked away somewhere too so uh, I'll, I'll let me stop the recording though